Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Thomas Campbell. I'm director and CEO of the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco. And today, I have the distinct honor of welcoming, welcoming you to the de Young Museum for this free Saturday program to celebrate Peru in San Francisco. <clears throat> Today's event marks the close of the bicentennial year of Peruvian independence. In partnership with the Peruvian consulate in San Francisco, we come together today to enjoy Peruvian music, dance, cuisine, and art, but also to highlight the long connection between Peru and the Bay Area. The Fine Art Museums of San Francisco are part of this, uh, of this inter interconnected history. The museums began collecting works by ancient Peruvian artists in the 1940s, including stunning feathered textiles and intricate miniature mosaics. While not currently on display, the works are featured in our newest collections highlight book, the de Young 125th anniversary publication and they will also be featured on the, the new website that we're currently developing. So I do, anyone wanting to find out immediately, take a look at that book. We've, had the, we've also had the opportunity to work with the Peruvian government in the past, namely on the presentation of the beautiful exhibition, Spirit of Ancient Peru. And we look forward to future collaborations that, that events like this inspire. In this afternoon's presentation, we will hear from Dr. Christine Hastorf, Director of the Archaeological Research Facility at UC Berkeley, about one of the largest and most important collections of ancient Peruvian art outside of Peru, the Max Ule Collection at the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum. Next, we will explore a different art form, music, through a presentation by award-winning composer Jimmy Lopez. Following the presentations, there will be a dance performance in the Wilsey Court outside in the, in the museum, and food tasting and music on the cafe ter terrace. So be sure to explore the rest of the offerings after this performance section. Through Free Saturdays, we aim to present programs that are diverse, inclusive, and center on representation and human connection. And today, I think this day is a testament to our commitment to accomplish that. Also, a reminder that general admission is always free on Saturdays at the de Young and at the Legion of Honor for Bay Area residents. Now, to say a few words about Peru in San Francisco and to welcome our speakers today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Consul General Hernando Torres Fernandez. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Mr. Thomas Campbell for hosting us here in, in this great and maybe one of the most beautiful museums of the West Coast in the United States. And uh, thank you also for your very efficient team. I should mention Hilary Olcott, who is very fond of Peru, Maria Eguaville, who is also Peruvian and that works in the events program, and Francesca D'Alessio. We are commemorating, I would prefer to use this word instead of celebrating, because, you know, after the pandemic, it uh, would, be, would be better to, to say this commemorating the bicentennial of Peru. Peru was 
the last country to, to get independence from the Spanish Empire. And why? Because Peru was the main site of the Spanish Empire in South America, was the biggest one, which capital was Lima, called the City of the Kings. At the beginning, there were only two vice royalties, Mexico in North America, or called also Nueva España, New Spain, and Peru in South America, which was almost half South America, which was also called Nueva Castilla, or Peru. But the history of Peru doesn't start there. As you know, Peru is one of the seven sources of civilization in the planet, with the Mayas, in, in Aztecas, in China, India, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Persia. And uh, before the Viceroyalty, there was this enormous empire, which was almost as big as the Viceroyalty, which was the called Tahuantinsuyo, or the Incas Empire, which capital was Cusco. So since the 19th century, Peru has received an enormous amount of immigrants from everywhere. If there is one word to describe, to define Peru, I would use it, I would use diversity, maybe, or extreme diversity, extreme biodiversity as well. Peru in size is more or less three times California, and we have 83 climates according to the altitude. So extreme geography because we have the highest lake in the world, the widest and largest river in the planet. You cannot see the other side when you are in, 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 in the one shore. We have mountains of 22,000 feet in the north of Lima, and cities that are 5,000 years old. And that could explain maybe this diversity, the success of the Peruvian gastronomy that we are going to taste after this performance. Peru, as I was telling you, has received immigrants since the 16th century from Africa, we had, unfortunately, slavery. And from the 19th century, we received immigrants from China. It's the biggest community in Latin America of Chinese origin is in Peru. I always tell that there are 4,000 Chinese restaurants in Lima, 4,000. Then came an enormous migration from Japan as well. We have the famous Nikkei food, which is fusion. Peruvian Japanese, very successful now. They're receiving a restaurant here in, in Marina. Italian, especially from Liguria, at the end of the 19th century, even Garibaldi, the famous unificator of, of Italy, lived in Peru two years. Palestinians, we have even small German cities in the middle of the jungle of Peru. And this Amazon forest is a great reserve. There was uh, one very important English scientist who said that if there is a third world war and the earth is almost destroyed, he can repopulate the planet again, just with one reserve that exists in the Amazon forest of Peru. By the way, the Amazon forest of Peru, Peru is composed by 23 counties. And one county is the Amazon forest, which is more or less the size of California. Well, I don't want to, to talk more. And just to introduce again, Mrs. Uh, Doctor, Christine Alstrop, 
She's a very distinguished professor of UC Berkeley, PhD in archaeology, and one of the uh, greatest specialists in Peruvian history and the, and, and, and the Andes as well. As Mr. Campbell mentioned, she's going to talk about this enormous collection. When I arrived to San Francisco four years ago, I had the chance to visit the president of Berkeley University. And she took me to the Phoebe Hearst Museum. Then I noticed that Phoebe Hearst was a great supporter of archaeological projects all around the world. And Phoebe Hearst paid the archaeological exploration of the German archaeologist Max Sule. So in that time, it was perfectly possible to bring the objects discovered in the excavations. We're talking about more or less one century ago. And I saw in Berkeley around 10,000 pieces of this greatest collection. Of course, not all of, not all of them are musable. Maybe, I don't know exactly, Christine could tell us later, but my original idea is most of San Franciscans and Californians don't know about this great collection. Why don't we exhibit it? And the first place I thought was, of course, the the Young Museum. So I hope that maybe in the future, Mr. Campbell, we could be able, I know it's difficult, it's expensive, it's not easy <laughs> to show maybe 100 pieces, the most beautiful, because this museum is about beauty as well, of this greatest collection. So San Franciscans and Californians could be very proud of having this big collection here. So I leave the floor. Thank you very much for being here. And I leave the floor to Christine Alstrup. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Here we go. I'm a professor, so it's well illustrated. <laughs> um, it is an absolute pleasure today to be part of the celebration of Peru's ties to San Francisco while celebrating 200 years of Peruvian independence. During my career as an archaeologist, it has been my honor to have been able to visit and work in Andean countries of South America, engaging with wonderfully diverse and rich history of Peru, Argentina, and Bolivia. I am here today to present just a small part of this very rich heritage that is present here in the Bay Area. The Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at the University of California Berkeley campus houses the largest collection of anthropological materials of any museum west of Chicago. The museum's earliest and most important collections were acquired by Phoebe Hearst who founded the museum actually in 1901 in San Francisco, seen here on the left, a building in San Francisco. In 1931, the university transferred the museum to the Berkeley campus, and most recently, in 1959, placed these materials in its current site on Bancroft Avenue, seen here on the right. Today, it holds major collections from California, Egypt, and Peru. So today, I, as um, um, we've heard, I'm going to focus on this collection, the wonderful, wonderful, rich Peruvian collection. The core of the Hearst Museum, almost 9,000 piece collection, is archaeological. And I'm not going to go through these details, but this gives you a sense of the, you know, pottery, shell, textiles, wood, metal, feather, and preciously, four volumes of notes. Phoebe Hearst supported three scientific expeditions of the German archaeologist Max Uhle to Peru. He'd been working there before for other museums, uh, Pen uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, Germany. But between 1899 and 1905, he uh, worked for Phoebe Hearst and gathered the bulk of this collection. 
Ulay wrote regular letters to Mrs. Hurst. Here you see uh, his, uh, just two pages from his letter. Uh, you can see they're all in English and actually very nice script. Here we see examples of his field notes where each piece uniquely receives an identifying number and listed by location of, of find in the field, which to us is extremely precious because it allows us to study the context. As many of you know, I'm sure, and we've heard already, uh, you can't stress enough the, um, the fabulous location that Peru is in. It's in the center of Western South America and it includes all archaeological, um, sorry, ecological zones, as we heard. This is uh, just a rough cartoon, but if you haven't been there, this gives you a sense of, of the quite remarkable landscape. Uh, every zone is there, and the other thing is they're next to each other. They're very close. It's steep, so good hiking boots. But it allows, um, because of the uplift of the tectonic plates, it's rapidly uplifting still today, much like our uh, Sierra Nevada. They're doing the same thing, hence our earthquakes. So the steep terrain uh, has allowed for uh, regular trade and communication between these zones across the Andes throughout uh, human history, which has allowed archaeologists to chart uh, the diversity of this area. This topography creates a very dry coast, with the Amazon being very wet, as the winds primarily come from the northeast blowing southwest and getting hit in running into the mountains and dropping its rain. So to start looking at a bit of this collection, um, we're going to um, take a, a, a road trip from north to south. Uh, the collection spans about 3,000 years of material from 1500 BCE or BC to 1500 CE or AD, depending on um, your like. The artifacts mainly come from the coast of Peru. That's where Ule worked, uh, from the Mote Valley in the north to the Chala Valley in the south, which are on this map. Other small but important collections were gained at Cusco, the Inca capital, in the southern highlands, and Huamanchuco in the northern highlands. Many of the artifacts come from graves or burial lots, and hence the material was not selected for artistic or technical qualities, but for their context and cultural information on being a one a, a deposit uh, with each burial. While such excavations are still only permitted by Peru's Ministry of Culture. No longer do scholars export what they excavate. Export permits are only gained for specific material that will be further analyzed, such as carbon-14 dating, genetics, or stable isotopic analysis. Subsequent studies of these grave lots here at the Hearst Museum, though, um, allow us to see um, many things, and one you see illustrated here through a, a, a creating chronological sequences upon which we reconstruct the Peruvian prehistory. This is illustrated particularly here for the Moche River Valley, where we're going to start today. Most associated artifacts have been stored together these past 60 years by grave lots to be able to better uh, um, study them culturally. Turning to these wonderful collections, let's take a look at some of the artifacts. But first, we're, going, we're starting in the Moche Valley. You see by the blue circle there, so you get a sense of where you are. Um, Ule worked there in 1899 and 1903. He returned there again. He'd worked there before for um, uh, Germany. And he focused on what we call the early intermediate period. And you see the dates here, the sort of 600 years, 100 to 700 CE. It's called the Moche polity. It has many names, but I'll be calling it Moche. The most hierarchical and elaborate of the Andean uh, region. And along Peru's coast, you can't stress enough, access to fresh water is vital, coming from the Sierras, coming from the mountains. This photo shows the edge of the irrigation system where nothing grows without water and everything grows with it. So here we are with where Ule excavated. Uh, there's two ceremonial uh, large pyramids. Uh, on this map, you see Huaca del Sol, Huaca de la Luna. Uh, there were large uh, stepped platform mounds constructed and used for a range of activities in the past. And Max Ule collect, uh, excavated 37 intact graves from the base of the Pyramid of the Moon, which you see here. Uh, he called it Site F. It's now called a platform, uh, Ule Platform or Platforma de Ule. 
indicated by the blue arrows so that you can sort of position yourself. The maps on the left are his, and the reconstruction is obviously modern. Being so close to a sacred place, the temple, Ule surmised that these would be particularly important people buried here, and he was right. Many of the burials have multiple offerings. He sketched the depth of these burials, noted in the lower drawing, which is a vertical map. You can see that chamber uh, at the lower part. The burials were uncovered 15 feet below the current ground surface. And the bodies tended to be seated in chambers built of mud, brick, and cane, about 12 by 4 by 3, so small rooms. So this image gives you a sense of two, two grave lots, two clusters, grave 16 and grave 19, and they illustrate the diverse types of vessels that accompanied the men and women who were buried near this pyramid. To get closer to these fabulous pieces, uh, I want to show you some specific vessels, again, focusing on the art. This slide and the next are vessels that illustrate surreal beings, hybrid beings that must have told stories and held great importance. Here are two beings that together meant something significant. This vessel with a broken off stirrup spout includes both a serpent and a wild cat around construction. Both of these beings today are associated with guarding springs and water sources, potable water sources informing us of their importance in maintaining fresh water on the coast. And again, all the water is coming from the highlands down the rivers. This next anthropomorphic vessel, with its complete stirrup spout created for ease in carrying, has both a three-dimensional image like a starfish with a face and a fanged mouth, you know, animating it, along with a two-dimensional painted creature that looks like a fish with legs. So again, a surreal being. Both of these beings are realistic yet not real, suggesting a link to their powers of the ocean with added supernatural forces. These stirrup spout vessels were most probably libation vessels filled with water or maize beer to offer liquid to the earth, uh, irrigation canals, sacred places uh, all throughout the landscape, as many people still do today throughout the Andean region. But there are also lots of natural uh, things that you can recognize, natural depictions. As seen in this slide, you see a hummingbird, you see a duck, and a frog, all very realistic. They also depicted themselves, both as important people, as seen in this portrait vessel on the left with an elaborate uh, headdress, but also working folk with a woman carrying a load and a warrior on bended knee. And this position of warriors is very common in the moche um, uh, imagery. It's obviously kind of a, a person at, at standing in position. These are also stirrup spouted vessels for liquid transport. So diving into one burial for a minute, let's look at some pieces from grave nine, again from site F, at the base of the pyramid of the moon. This was an elite burial with 23 vessels and several flat pieces of copper. This slide shows this collection in two um, orientations from the storage trays in the Hearst Museum, taken just last week. So here are some examples of two-dimensional painted vessels in this classic cream on red that is so common in the Moche era. You can see the fine line painting style that can be quite realistic and expressive. The vessel on the left illustrates one of the main warrior classes, the bean warrior. Beans becoming warriors holds a real fascination for me, as all other moche warrior groups tend to be people or animals. The deer, that's a very popular one as well, but the bean is my favorite. What was significant about beans in the moche society that would elevate them to be a warrior class? There are also everyday items within this same grave lot, both for carrying liquid, but also for serving meals, as you see here. Really very elegant still, though. But I want to uh, zero down on one more, uh, one further vessel, in particular, that's also been studied by my colleague, Lisa Trevor. This is a portrait vessel of a human head with advanced leishmaniasis, a disease caused by sand flies that results in skin ulcers as well as damage to the soft tissue of the nose and mouth, which you can sort of see the retreating 
uh, nose and mouth on this. You can also see the sand flies around the chin. But it is also a potato, illustrated by the many eyes. That's why I put the, the, the back side of the picture up. So it's multiple things at once. It's like, almost like a puzzle. This vessel portrays the living dead, including both open eyes of this, the head, but also growth, the sprouting and rebirth that potatoes have out of their eyes. But all, and, and further, we know it's a head of a dead person, a dead head, um, good for San Francisco, um, because of the plates you see painted on the, um, on the cranium, those are, re those are copper plates that are put on the dead in the Moche area when people were buried. So they're playing with us. They're telling us this person's alive but also dead. It's, it's this essence of rebirth uh, in this, uh, informing us about Andean worldviews, which makes it so evocative. In these burials here in the Huacas del Moche, there are other things too, and this is just an example of copper items. These are copper bells that made up a large necklace. But Ule also uncovered workshop evidence between the two pyramids, seen in this example of shell working. The shells on the right are spondylus, brought down from the Ecuadorian coast, so an important trade ware, along with large conch shells made into trumpets. So this was a manufacturing site of very expensive and important and sacred items. Later in time, uh, Burials near the base of the Pyramid of the Sun include local post-moche ceramics called the Sikan, and you can see how very, very different this pot is from what we've been looking at, the cream on red. This is, this is um, not as realistic and not as colorful. It's all reduced, it's very black, and extremely stylized being, almost like a, a chief or a king, this essence with two felines, as you see, hovering on either side. Another post-moche bit of evidence um, is this pot, which has obviously been put back together uh, from the middle horizon, a later period, uh, coming from the highlands. This is strong highland influence in this large drinking tumbler. Uh, the dark red, note that dark red background that you see reflecting the highland Wari and Tiwanaku imperial influences on the coast after the moche. There are also many wooden deities depicted up and down the coast. Here you have two examples from the Moche region, again, beautifully painted that would have been up on poles or paraded around on uh, lintels. And finally, from this region, I share you one of my favorite items, an unbaked clay being, a sacred holder of energy and power for the renewal of crops that was, is often buried and was clearly often buried uh, to give strength to the owner. Moving to the middle coast, along the Supe, Chancay, and Rimac rivers, Ule excavated in the sites of Chimucapac and Niviera, both pre-Inca sites. This is beautiful. Um, I wanted to start with the, the most beautiful here. Um, this wonderful tunic, again from the middle horizon, emphasizing that beautiful dark red color that really becomes important at that time period. Note the wonderful fine details that are woven into the main body, and I try to include a lot of up-close pictures for you to enjoy. Chiang Kai, the Chiang Kai Valley, has very distinctive ceramic style, quite different from what we've seen, with a rough surface texture and almost cartoon-like faces on these body pots. And again, these body pots mean a lot. They're, the body of the leader is giving drink to their colleagues. So it is very highly represented, repre representational. And there's cotton weavings that abound on the coast. This is just one example of a front face deity painted onto a cotton woven cloth. And, and this person, this deity is holding po uh, power images, a, a staff of power and um, a flower that also uh, represents this re renewal and rebirth. Whoops, sorry. Uh, wood and gourd artifacts are also found here. Um, and this is actually a really wonderful piece. This is a wooden lime container. There's a lid that comes on and off, and it would hold the collar, the lime, that would be used to activate the coca leaves uh, in chewing. So it would be part of a, a ceremonial use. And um,
a, a final one from Chiang Kai is that was actually submitted by Mrs. Mrs. Charlotte Ulay uh, to the museum, a beautiful gauzy cotton, beautifully dyed cotton textile, which I wanted to share with you. From the Rimac uh, River Valley, just to the south where Lima is, um, Ule excavated in Niveria, a Lima culture as it's called, site, uh, where he found a range of textile fragments and clear middle horizon redwares that you see here. And this is clearly mimicking a gourd, even though it is a ceramic vessel. The final region we'll look at today is in the Chincha, Ica, and the Nazca area in the south. This region is even more dry than the northern valleys as the rivers do not flow year round. Ule's work in the Chincha and Inca valleys are the most thorough documentation of a cultural sequence, creating the temporal sequence of Peru that was developed in the Berkeley uh, Hearst Museum uh, by my forebearers. So in, starting in the north of this region, in the Chincha Valley, Ule excavated a series of cemetery graves. The preservation is so good here, he encountered a range of textiles. And in site E, as you see here, some items from there, you see a little basket. And that basket is filled with spinning equipment, buried with a woman, uh, all the tools, the whorls, and distaffs that she would have used. Plus, you see here one of two beautiful silver ear spools there on the right which would have been worn by a very important woman. Moving south into the Ica Valley, this is one of my favorite items from here, a ceramic pan pipe. Most of the pan pipes we're used to are made of cane, um, with, uh, but here you see it made of ceramic with classic South Coast painting style, fine line, colorful items on, on a cream background to be played in the rainy season to bring water. Two early intermediate period ceramics from Ica barriers, bur bur burials are here. This is the same time period as the moche material we were looking at. And you can see some hint of, of communication and similarity, yet very dif different. The southern artists were even more detailed oriented than the moche, as seen in both of these vessels, painting with very fine line outlines of every attribute to make them pop out at you. On the right is a monkey holding a piece of fruit with the South Coast style of libation spout and handle, quite different from the stirrup spouts we saw in the North. The Nazca crafts folk were masters of deception, one of my favorite parts of their material. They often made items like uh, other items, skewomorphs, meaning to look like something else made from a different material. Ceramics like baskets are, are on the left. You can see how they look like woven baskets if you blur your eyes. And on the right, the front bowl is an, it's a ceramic image, a ceramic bowl mimicking the back bowl, which is silver. They're both the same, and they look the same up close, but one is ceramic and one is silver. Here they are up close, and they're, I'm sorry they're not the best I could get, but um, I, I couldn't, get, couldn't get closer to them right now. So they're from site T in the same grave. So this person who took them with them um, had elegant style, I think. One, you know, the silver is on the right, and that's being mimicked on the left. Even the pinching, you notice the pinching to make it look like it was uh, attached like a, a metal, but in clay. Quite wonderful. Willie also excavated later material, in this case, Inca phase burials. Here we see amazing items from that era with a beautiful Inca liquid bowl, an urpu, or aribolo, it used to be called, but I prefer urpo, um, of the Inca style. Uh, you also have another woven basket there with uh, the tools of spinning equipment that went, uh, and, and a series of other beautiful, elegant tumblers out of wood, that carved wood, and also that lovely, almost like a picaflor um, pot. And really a beautiful, beautiful Inca uh, women's uh, belt uh, made with a cochinilla red that comes in in the middle horizon on the uh, fabrics, so we can date it from from the red color, but also just the exquisite work that is the craftsmanship that you see here. Some well-to-do Inca era, Ica 
people were buried with golden goblets. And these are really quite classic um, Incaic uh, material buried with these local residents, again, for, for libating. The Drynoska Pampa, or, or valley, uh, plain, is famous for its geoglyphs, or called the Nazca lines uh, out there in the world. We call them geoglyphs. <laughs> also, uh, also had a, a huge, a very large Nazca face ceremonial center called Kawachi with 40 step platform mounds. We had two up in the Moche, they had 40. They were smaller, uh, uh, built by different, uh, probably different uh, families. Uli spent some time there as well, and there he uncovered some wonderful objects that we will finish up with today. Here you see some text, a textile pouch fragment on the left illustrating felines, the pompous cat, which is a very famous, iconic image, and still the cat is uh, rare but present today, and I thought you might like to look at what the pompous cat looks like, because you can see those same attributes in the weavings, right? And then some ceramic beads, something that I hadn't shown you yet. But these are fantastic, huge, polished ceremonial digging sticks, uh, like uh, to open the earth for farming. But these were, these were used. There's wear on them, but they weren't used for um, agriculture. I think they might have been used actually to help make the geoglyphs. Ceramically, the Nazca style is highly elaborate. These next few slides display just a fraction of the range of beings and activities that are depicted on them, like the moche, both supernatural and natural. A supernatural being is seen here on the left, and the right depicts a musician, really quite realistic, almost comical. This is exquisite. This large tumbler is quite spectacular. It's anthropomorphic killer whale. Notice the tail. When you look on the side, you see the tail. When you look at the front, it looks like a person. This person is holding a, a netted a net over their shoulder with, filled with fish. In one hand, like a fisherman, and in the other hand, they're holding a, a head like a shaman or a knower. So very powerful being. But this illustrates all the colorings that the Nazca so loved. The pompous cat, as mentioned before, is an important being throughout the Andes and is often depicted on Nazca libation ceramics. While these cats can be quite naturalistic, they are often being depicted doing surreal actions, holding things uh, and enacting events. I just think they're wonderful. Finally, these last two beautiful drinking tumblers display the eloquence of the Nazca artist's color and painting skill and their aesthetic. The vessel on the left depicts warriors running over mountains. You can look and see the cactus being illuminated on the mountains. The one on the right is a supernatural Sami being, the animating essence of life that is portrayed quite abstractly. It was actually on the killer whales uh, uh, corona as well. It's quite common, but it looks abstract unless you study it in detail. And the people who studied this over the years at the Hearst have, have uh, sort of finally deciphered it, thankfully. So having rushed through just a small sample of the fabulous collection that UC Berkeley and the Bay Area is honored to have and to be able to engage with and see, I hope that I have provided a sense of the wonders that were created by ancestral Peruvians. We are very fortunate to have this precious material in the Bay Area. Thank you very much for this invitation today. On with the music. Thank you very much, Christine. It was really impressive. It's amazed. I'm amazed to know that just a few miles away from here, there is this permanent collection in, in a very good storage at the Phoebe Hearst Museum. Uh, by the way, right now there is a very important exhibition of. Uh, uh, ancient Peru in, at the British Museum in London. And um, I happen to know that the director of the British Museum said to the Peruvian ambassador there during the inauguration one week ago that Peruvian textiles, ancient Peruvian textiles, are not comparable with any ancient culture in the planet. 
Now I would like to introduce uh, a Peruvian composer, but it's not just any composer. <laughs> it's a young composer, only 43 years old, but I'm not I don't exaggerate if I say that he's the most famous, most important composer, Peruvian composer in the world right now. Why? Because if you just Google, <laughs> you'll see that his compositions, his works are being performed right now and last year and next year are going to be as well by the most important most famous symphony orchestras of Europe, United States, Canada, and also Latin America. When two years ago I had the, the great pleasure to go to uh, call performances in Berkeley and to realize that the Philharmonic Orchestra from London arrived especially with this famous director, which is now the director of the Symphony Orchestra of San Francisco, Esa Pekka Salone, the Finnish conductor, he came to play for the first time an oratorio by Jimmy Lopez, inspired in the DACA problem that all we know. So it's a, a great honor to have Jimmy here. He lives also in Berkeley. I think Berkeley is a concentration place for many Peruvians, and I leave the floor to Jimmy Lopez. Well, hello. Thank you, Hernando, for that generous introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to the museum as well for having me and um, for celebrating Peruvian culture in this very important year. We have turned 200 years indeed, and uh, there is a lot of work to be done, but a lot to be proud of as well. I, as a composer, of course, uh, feel the inspiration to come from all sources, but especially Peruvian music has played an important role. But I will, before we get there, I'll walk you through more or less my beginnings. Um, I, am not, I was born in 78 uh, to not a musical family. My father was an architect. Uh, my mother is a now retired kindergarten teacher, and my sister is a biologist. So music was not running in our blood. Um, but about uh, the time that I was five years old, my sister started to take piano lessons, electronic keyboard to be precise. And Apparently, I will go there and just bother her so much that my mom finally offered to give uh, lessons to me as well. So she hired a piano teacher, and from then on, music became a part of my life. However, I was not really passionate about music the way I became in my early teens. Um, I think music was more or less a hobby, and I think during my early childhood, my main interest might have had to do with science and robotics. So, but there was something that really changed the course of things for me. Uh, at the time I was 11 years old, my whole family moved to Miami. Those were difficult times in Peru. This is the year 1990, and um, you know, terrorism was uh, rampant in the country, and so my parents wanted for us to emigrate and to really experience life somewhere else with the possibility of staying, perhaps. In the end, our stay was short. We only remained in, in Miami, Florida for one year, but that really had an important impact in me uh, at all levels. Now, I was a very introvert child, so music became extremely important at that point in time because that was my one way of expression, and that's when I started to write music. Well, not really to write it down, but to actually compose music. So I would sit at the piano, and I would, you know, uh, create tunes. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing, but I, th I knew that uh, there was something going on, and it gave me an escape and a way to channel uh, whatever I was experiencing. When we came back to Peru, um, I went, well, I went back to the, 
to the school where I was studying, uh, Santa Maria Marianistas, and we were very lucky that we had a very good music program there. Now, one day I was walking past um, the music department and the piano teacher, the music teacher really was playing a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, it was a short invention uh, in two voices that sounded unlike anything I had listened to until that time. And all its intricate harmonies and counterpoint and textures sounded like nothing I had been exposed to because really like any other child I had been listening to mostly popular music and that and just the knowledge that that had been written like about 300 years ago just blew my mind. So I want to share with you that invention uh, performed here by a very young child about the age I was at that time. Well, she's nine years old in this video, Anna Kuvnishov, a very young Russian pianist, and she's going to play for you Bach's invention number 13 in A minor. to win that competition, <laughs> not surprising. Um, well, so about that time I was uh, 11 years old and I was hooked. I knew I wanted to become a musician and didn't know exactly what, perhaps a pianist, although I had very, very little technique really. Um, but about the age of 16, the Lima Philharmonic Orchestra was established and they didn't have a place to rehearse um, and now its conductor, uh, Miguel Harpedoya, a celebrated orchestra conductor, he established the Philharmonic and was very good friends with the music teacher of my high school, so serendipity, and that meant that the orchestra was rehearsing at my high school. And so I would attend all the rehearsals and I would be going with my music scores, of course, and trying to understand how how music worked. And it really is, is more about just when you go to a concert, the end result. What I was fascinated about was the rehearsal itself and to see the conductor dissect the orchestra by sections, just the brass or just the brass and strings and things that you would otherwise not hear during a concert or a recording. So that was very revealing and that made me fall in love with the orchestra. By the time I graduated from school in 95, I wasn't ready to enter the National Conservatory of Music because I didn't have enough knowledge in music. So I had to spend two years preparing myself uh, with lessons, uh, private professors, and especially Enrique Iturriaga was a major influence, a composer who recently died in 2019 at the age of 101. And he's the dean of all composers and most musicians in Peru. And he really was my personal Yoda, I like to say, because he really was a, someone who would guide me and our lessons would extend between four to eight hours and there was not a dull moment because he would bring lots of methods to just explain a single rule of counterpoint because there was always the beauty uh, to everything, not just the mechanics of how things work. So when I was ready, I entered the conservatory uh, but only two years later, I knew that I wanted to go somewhere else. And 
um, summing up, of course, I ended up in Finland. Now, Finland is a very musical country, uh, five and a half million people, 11 full symphony orchestras, 25 symphony orchestras proper, and um, a great respect for contemporary composers, and Sibelius, John Sibelius, a composer, is a national hero who actually was in their $100 mark bill before the euro was introduced. Um, so Finland was really a place that changed many things in my life. I went there when I was 21. I spent most of my 20s there doing my Master of Music degree at uh, Sibelius Academy. So, but Finland also brought something interesting, and that was that it really was the thing that connected me back to Peru. Why? Because in Finland, I was a little bit, uh, let's say, extrapolated from Peru. And I was, after a few years there, uh, I felt this sense of disconnect, of not belonging, of being a foreigner, that we all experience when we're in a foreign country. But in addition to that, as being an artist, I was also questioned constantly about what it is that you are bringing to the table in terms of music. I mean, are you going to blend in and sound like another European composer, or are you going to bring something that's original? Now, that's a lot of pressure for a 20-something-year-old trying to find uh, his own voice. And something that I learned later on just happens with time. However, an opportunity came when uh, the then uh, Minister of education of Peru, Javier Soto Nadal, commissioned me to write a work for the opening of the new, um, the new building of the National Library of Peru. Now, that was a very important occasion, attended by the president and all that. And so I was a little nervous about what to do to commemorate such, such an occasion. Until then, honestly, most of my works had not been inspired by Peru or Peruvian music. Quite the contrary. As I was living in Peru, I was always having my eyes in Europe. So what I, it was only when I was in Europe that I actually turned my eyes back to Peru and, and said, well, uh, there's a lot of music out there to be uncovered. Of course, it was only my ears because I've been listening to it all the time, but I had never really allowed it, allowed it to enter you know, the musical style uh, and my, my writing itself. So that was a perfect opportunity. Now, um, since it was the opening of a national library, I decided that I wanted to write a, a symphonic poem, which is a form that blends literature and music. And I used a poem called Blason by Jose Santos Chocano, which starts with a line that says, uh, Soy el cantor de América autóctono y salvaje. I am the, I am the chanter of uh, America uh, autochthonous, you know, original and, and savage in a way, or, or, or uh, you know, wild in a way. So the, the, the piece is called uh, America Salvaje, which means wild Americas. And um, that first uh, stanza proved a challenge because it talks about a time prior to the arrival of the Europeans to the, to the American continent. And so here I am with a symphony orchestra trying to portray that full of European instruments. So that offered a unique challenge, and I decided, well, I cannot open with the regular instruments of the orchestra. I need to bring other instruments into this piece. And I decided to bring pututos, which are conch shells, some of which you saw already in the previous, <laughs> in, in one of the slides. And I brought ocarinas and bird whistles. So I want to show you uh, the opening, just the opening two minutes, of America Salvaje, conducted by Andres Orozco Estrada and played by the Frankfurt Radio Symphony. <laughs> well, there's another 11 minutes of music coming after that, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's, thankfully that's on YouTube, so it's easy to search if you're interested in listening to the rest of the piece. Now, uh, a few years later, in 2012, about six years later, uh, Miguel Harvedoya, who became a really close collaborator of mine, uh, commissioned me to write a work called Peru Negro. Now, this work, he asked me directly, I want you to write the apotheosis of Peruvian, Afro-Peruvian music. Now, there's a work by uh, Maurice Ravel called La Valse, which is kind of the apotheosis of the Viennese waltz. And he kind of told me, more or less, this is what, I, what I'm looking for. So 
not an easy task, of course, but the first thing to do was to research Afro-Peruvian music, which was a delight because I was always in love with it. I think it's one of the most rich and varied in terms of rhythm, uh, especially uh, genres of music that we have in Peru. Also very unique instruments using cajon, you know, and jawbone, which are very, very unique to that uh, style of music and to that region of the world. So I went on to research and basically it's, it's a 16 to 17 minute work. You will listen to an excerpt. But the important thing about it is that it is directly inspired by specific uh, genres. Like the first one is called Pregón, the second one is Toromata, which is an actual song, an actual style of Afro-Peruvian music. Then there come others like Inga, Le Dije a Papá, Son de los Diablos, all of those inspired by Afro-Peruvian music. So what I've decided before I show you the excerpt of the actual piece, I, I put back to back two excerpts just comparing the source and my version of things for you to, to be able to see. So Le Dije Papá here performed by Eva Yon, a very famous Afro-Peruvian singer. She, um, this is a festejo. This is, a, this is the, the name of the genre of within Afro-Peruvian music is called festejo. And so this is what the original source sounds like. <laughs> The second example is from the almost the final section of the piece, and this is a Son de los Diablos, also a different kind of dance. Source first. <laughs> see I mean the it's very salient and very clear and like this I could actually compile 12 15 examples uh, along the piece but you know the piece doesn't feel like a tour through Afro-Peruvian music it really is a, a piece that has its own organic development and its own uh, thematic cohesion but of course uh, the challenge was to remain true to the source, but also remain true to myself as an artist, you know, and not just create uh, a mere imitation of, the, of Peruvian music, but something that, that really is more or less absorbed within what I do, and also uh, very, very personal. So now, the next excerpt, I think we're ready to listen to two minutes of a central section that leads to the climax of the piece, and this is a very young, Finnish conductor called Klaus Makela, and this is the Helsinki Philharmonic Orchestra, playing Peru Negro.
Thank you. Thank you. That was, I was actually at that performance, so I was very excited to, to be there for that. And um, I'm going to mention later a concert which you can attend and listen to this piece live here in San Francisco very soon. So more on that at the end of the talk. Now, I wanted to title my, uh, my talk Peru-inspired works because not all of them, not all of them are inspired by Peru. And also, there are many ways that one can get inspired by Peru. In these two last examples, um, the first one comes from the instruments, the second from a musical style or tradition, and this third one, it comes from our history, actually. So, very recent history, in fact. Um, I was commissioned by the Lyric Opera of Chicago and René Fleming the opera called Bel Canto. Now, Bel Canto is a book by Anne Patchett, and she turned, um, basically this book is, is fiction. However, it is very much rooted in real events that took place in Peru between the end of 96 and 1997. So she told me she, she has actually, she, she hadn't been to Peru at that time, and didn't know much where she was glued to the news uh, because there was a hostage, hostage crisis that took place there that really grabbed headlines around the world. Now, uh, a Peruvian uh, a terrorist group called uh, Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru uh, stormed into a very big event at the ambassador's residence, the Japanese ambassador's residence in Lima. Actually, my friend Hernando was there and was a hostage for a few days, in fact, five days. Uh, the whole crisis lasted 126, and, and it was really a standoff with a core group of 72 hostages and about 16 of those terrorists, many of whom were very, very young. And, um, you know, those were, this is actually a part of our history that's a very difficult one to deal with uh, because uh, it is recent and it awakens passions. And also because at that point in time, we were heading towards prosperity finally after the dark time of the 80s and early 90s. And then this co comes, and then of course it is a bit disheartening, but thankfully things got better after that. Now when Rene commissions me <laughs> to write, to read the book, you know, first, uh, I realized that I had a great responsibility in bringing this to the stage. But I was also very happy that, you know, I was gonna do it because I think someone who was there, I was 18 years old at the time of the crisis, would do it better than perhaps someone who had not even had any personal connection with it. So I took it on as a task, a challenge, but also a great responsibility. And uh, together with librettist Nilo Cruz, I decided to bring in a few more of the actual events to the book. Because in the book, not everything is very explicit. We don't really know that we are in Peru or in Lima, uh, aside from some hints. But you know, when you stage an actual work on an opera stage and you have clothes and you know, customs, you have, you have to make a, a very clear statement. So we, we really focused on, on being inspired by the history, but also true to the story. Now, I'm going to show you something, um, an excerpt of three minutes from the opera. You're going to see a character that's, that did not, you know, did not exist in real life. Because in the book, alongside with all the other hostages, a famous American soprano is trapped. Now, the reason why Anne Patchett brings uh, this fictional character into the book is because she wants to, you know, her to symbolize uh, how music can actually unite people from different walks of life. So throughout the whole crisis, this soprano serves as a glue and, and music serves as a, as a communicative tool between terrorists and hostages. So she grows very important as the, the plot continues. But in this particular section that you're gonna see, um, basically all the guests are gathered and are about to listen to her sing an aria. And at the end of the aria, that's when the first explosions take place and they storm into, into the ambassador's residence. So here is Bel Canto, and in the title role, uh, Daniel Denise and the Lyric Opera of Chicago, conducted by Andrew Davis.
from Lyric Opera of Chicago, Bel Canto, the opera, on great performances. Well, it's now time to end the talk. It's been a pleasure to be here with you, and I wanted to invite you, as promised, to April 28th, 29th, and 30th of next year. Uh, the same conductor that you saw conducting the second piece, Klaus Makela, is gonna come here to conduct the ESF Symphony, and he will play Peru Negro. Now, also on June 12th, uh, there is a world premiere with the Berkeley Symphony of a piece called Rise, uh, that is basically an opening uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Berkeley Symphony, followed by Beethoven's Ninth. So two opportunities to listen to music live, if you are here in the Bay Area. Thank you very much. Jimmy, I cannot praise you enough. For those who would like to know more about my experience being a hostage there for five days, we can talk during the testing of Peruvian little delicatessen. So I would like you now to invite you, please, all of you, to go to the hall where we are going to see a performance of Peruvian, famous Peruvian dance called Marinera, Marinera Norteña, Marinera from the north of Peru. You know, Peru has 23 regions. Each region has its own gastronomy, its own dances, its own folklore. So, and after that, that's going, this is pop music, after this very elaborated music. And then that's going to last maybe 10 minutes. And then I invite all of you to go to the cafe just ahead to, to taste some Peruvian delicatessen. Thank you very much. Thank you.